Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Engineering Student Experience Podcast. I'm Paul Nissenson from the Mechanical Engineering Department at Cal Poly Pomona. This is the second special episode in a row related to the ongoing global pandemic. In the last episode, which I recorded on March 24th, 2020, I talked with two current engineering students to find out how they're adjusting to social distancing and the sudden shift to online instruction. I recorded today's episode one day later, on March 25th, 2020, and not much has changed. Many of us in the U.S. are still hunkering down, awaiting the first major wave of COVID-19 patients to start flooding the hospitals. Personally, I'm just staying at home, trying to keep busy with online teaching, grading, making these podcasts, and I'm looking forward to a time when life will return to normal, whenever that will be. This episode is going to focus on how engineering faculty have been adjusting to the sudden shift to online instruction. Faculty across the world have been forced to quickly learn new software to continue instruction and are having to rethink how they assess student performance in an online environment. I think it's fair to say that this is the greatest amount of faculty development that's ever gone on at the same time throughout the history of higher education. And just to make the entire situation more interesting, faculty often have children, which they now need to care for 24 hours a day since the schools are closed. Some are caring for elderly parents. And some faculty are elderly themselves and must be extra vigilant to prevent getting infected since advanced age is a significant risk factor. Joining me today are two colleagues from my university, Dr. Nolan Suchia from my department, Mechanical Engineering, and Dr. Jessica Perez from the Electromechanical Engineering Technology Department. Both Nolan and Jessica were previous guests on the podcast, Nolan from Episode 4 and Jessica from Episode 10. The three of us discuss our experiences of what it's been like to suddenly be forced to radically change our style of teaching and interacting with students. We discuss the challenges and potential benefits of teaching online, how our students are handling the transition to online instruction, and possible long-term impacts of this grand experiment that we're all engaged in together. Before we jump into the interview, I feel compelled to warn you that the audio quality will be a bit poorer than normal since I had to conduct the interview online without my normal equipment. And as I mentioned in the last episode, I recognize that the upbeat music played at the beginning and during transitions, isn't quite appropriate for the theme of the episode. I'll try to find some open source music that's more somber in tone for future episodes that deal with this crisis. At any rate, I hope you enjoy the conversation. All right, I'm here talking with Nolan Suchia and Jessica Perez, two of my engineering colleagues at Cal Poly Pomona. So Nolan, Jessica, thanks so much for taking some time to have this conversation, this online conversation during this uh, crazy time. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having me. It'd be probably helpful if you could give a little bit of background, especially as it relates to teaching to the listeners. Mm -hmm. So how long have you been teaching? What courses were you teaching this semester that got interrupted? And you know, what are the types of students you typically teach in a, in a typical semester? And maybe Nolan can go first. Uh, yeah, sure. So I've been uh, full-time at Cal Poly for uh, five years, five and a half years now. And this particular semester, I'm teaching a couple sections of control systems, uh, as well as a, a section of dynamic systems. Um, that's pretty typical for me. Uh, the students that those courses cover are mostly third and fourth year uh, students, so juniors and seniors mostly. Um, And then a couple of, uh, once in a while, there's some grad students in there as well. So I've been teaching at Cal Poly. This is my third academic year, so um, I've been there two and a half years. I started in 2017. Um, And so typically I'm teaching the other half of what Nolan's teaching, right? I teach mostly first and second year students. I have um, the Intro to Engineering class, the Engineering Society and you, 
And then I have statics and dynamics. So I have all the foundational level courses. So I see mostly um, first, second, and sometimes third year students. So before we talk about how this crisis has impacted your teaching, you know, how has this crisis impacted you personally? You know, maybe um, your, your family, your, your children. Uh, do you have conferences that were canceled, trips that were canceled that were personal? Do you have enough supplies for the next couple of weeks? Sure, yeah. As I was mentioning before, yeah, a little bit about myself. We have two little kids at home, and obviously both of them are no longer in school. Schools are closed down, um, four-year-old and almost two-year-old. So life is pretty crazy even before this, and now I'm at home 100% of the time, but my wife is still a nurse on the front lines, so she's still going to work, which makes my load uh, extra. I don't know how to put that other than it's challenging right now. <laughs> um, so switching back and forth between work mode and sort of dad mode has been one of the biggest challenges. But yeah, a number of, of conferences, the uh, ASWE, PSW was postponed, the CSU Symposium was postponed. Um, I'm also the advisor for two of our racing clubs on campus. So the Baja SAE team and the Formula SAE team uh, both each, uh, both each had two competitions that were scheduled, and those are canceled. We had a trip to a family trip to Zion planned for spring break, which is also uh, canceled now. So it's a whole lot of sheltering in place and trying to get supplies when the panic buyers sort of uh, cease and sort of get what you can when you can. Uh, but yeah, it's been definitely a challenge at home personally. That's for sure. I was actually just thinking earlier today about how grateful I am. I do have two children that are home all the time now, but they're older. They're um, 13 and 15. And I was just thinking how grateful I am that I don't have little kids anymore. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Nolan. No be there. problem. <laughs> You'll be there soon enough, Nolan. Right. Yeah. Well, then you have a whole different host of issues because they're both teenagers at the same time. And <laughs> I thought to myself, why did I do this to myself when I, you know, I, I did it to, um, but Different problems. Different problems. Different, 100%. yeah. Sure. Um, but they're very independent. Like, I've always kind of raised them to be a little independent. So they're just doing their thing and homeschooling. Um, we're definitely testing the limits of our Wi-Fi because all of us are on the computer all the time now. Um, but really trying to be mindful of how they're interacting with it, too. So it's a balance because, um, you know, their activities were canceled. So that gives us a lot more free time. But also it's something that they miss and they're not – able to connect with their friends and everything um and so it's it's a balance we were again same nolan and i apparently traveled to the same conferences all of those were postponed and then you know we had a per we had a family trip planned for spring break as well and we're gonna be at home for spring break which we're at a staycation with um you know the dog and it'll be fine but i would say that the flexibility that and the resilience that my my own children have shown has been, I mean, pretty impressive. I didn't anticipate that they would be as independent as they are, and I'm pretty very grateful they're not born to. <laughs> yeah, if I have to sing um, "Into the Unknown" one more time, I may lose it. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a that's a reference to. A frozen movie yes it oh, sure okay, is. okay yeah no yeah. i i didn't i didn't get it due to my my lack of children <laughs> yeah probably you wouldn't but it's one of those songs that's on repeat in our house yeah, yeah my 15 year old he's a professional social distancer anyways like he he's never gonna catch anything because he's in his room all the time but <laughs> it's typical teenager behavior so yeah. yeah so they're so he's fine then he's fine <laughs> He really doesn't want to go back to school. He's like, homeschool for the rest of the world? Fine. I'll make this the rest of high school. And my daughter definitely is ready to go back. Uh, yeah. yeah, I had to give up the same conferences that Nolan gave up. And yeah, I had a trip to Europe that I was supposed to fly out in a couple of days. But yeah, that's not happening. So Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bummer. Yeah. And Europe will still be there probably. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> So now that we're all kind of thrust into teaching online, um, before that happened, what kind of experience did you have doing anything online? So, you know, using the, the learning management system of the university, you know, making videos, 
did you ever teach a course online before? I've taught a course online before. Um, I've taught the same course online and in a hybrid form. So I taught um, a lecture course that was independent online. And then I taught a lecture course and that was online with the lab. So the same students were in the lecture and lab together. So I saw them every week for lab, but I didn't see them for their lecture time. And so I was familiar with the online, um, the learning management system. I was struggling with like keeping up with um, first year students in an online class is really hard because if you don't remind them consistently that they have assignments to do and you know, out of sight, out of mind, like many of us that are even adults, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And so I had a lot of um, first year students struggling with the online class, which is kind of partly why I knew that when we went to online instruction, I didn't want to do asynchronous learning for my, especially my lower division students. I wanted to keep it synchronous as much as possible so that I'm still seeing them, I'm still interacting with them, and the pace of the class is still maintained for them, um, especially if it's mid-semester transition. So I um, had done some videoing, I had done some can't take, like, but it wasn't as um, successful as I hoped it would have been necessarily, and I have taught online classes to varying degrees of success. But I think um, keeping my students this time in a synchronous environment with using Zoom, and then I, for those that can't reach it synchronously, it's still available asynchronously, but there's still interaction with the students. And I think it's important, especially when there's a mid-semester transition like this. Yeah, that's interesting. The, the only things I've done online so far are use our LMS, which is Blackboard for us. That's the primary mode of communication I have for students in terms of uh, assignments and, and lab and just syllabus and general information. Um, I've also done quite a bit of making videos, but those are all sort of tutorial series videos where I had a, a lot of time to sort of script it out um, and think about the exact examples that I wanted to show. Um, and so I, teaching in this format uh, where you need to make a video you know, very frequently, you don't have the luxury of that, of that time. So that's been a challenge. Um, so I do have some experience with um, using the LMS and making some videos. This is actually the first time I've ever taught a full course in any, uh, in any type of online format. So are you teaching uh, synchronously or asynchronously? Yeah, so right now, uh, with both my classes, I'm going asynchronous, uh, oh, just okay. because it seems like a sort of a baby step into a synchronous format. You know, with pre-recording the lectures, there's a little bit of a buffer where I have a chance to sort of develop those in a, in a way that I'm happy with and then get the students to watch those and just have a discussion with them in a live mode during the, the normal class time. So I, it sounds like I'm kind of doing opposite of what Jessica's doing. Right. Uh, probably right. because, yeah, it just feels safer to me this way. I'm not relying on internet issues if it's synchronous and things like that and also you have third and fourth year students so they might be able to well, handle that i was thinking. right yeah um, yeah well we'll see i don't know this is very much an, uh, an experiment sort of first experience for me doing this type of teaching i've already changed a bunch of things like um, i was trying to give tests and quizzes that were not working out for me and i've already modified like how i'm assessing students and really being open and honest with students as we're going through, like, hey, this is where I'm at. This is kind of um, moving forward. This is how I'm going to modify exams. And it's going to be continually fluid for that too. Like, you know, we're going to try this next couple of weeks after spring break. Um, they have an exam and they have a couple quizzes. We're going to try out some things. And then if it doesn't work, we'll try it again. I will definitely say my first attempt was not the best. Um, but then that means that I modify how I have to assess too. Um, if you have all the time and all the resources of the, you know, internet, you have to test differently. And so really looking at that, like learning to learn model and instead of just assessing to have like very basic understanding it, now we're looking for that second and third level of understanding on costas. Like, are you really synthesizing information? Are you making good assumptions? are you able to be clear about what you're saying? And it's really, it's reframed how I'm assessing in a good way. Yeah, so before March, and before it became clear that we were gonna have to go to online instruction, I know in Nolan in my department, 
you know, basically no one was teaching online classes. The department didn't really care if you did anything like made videos, but there really wasn't a, a culture of making online courses. And I'm really curious to know if that's going to change going forward, but I'm wondering in your department, Jessica, was it similar? Was I would actually say it was anti-online learning, like not anti-online learning, but there was definitely no rush to make a hybrid class or an online class. And teachers were providing information on the learning management system, like posting things beforehand just so students were prepared. But there definitely wasn't a push to make it a more flexible learning. There just wasn't a push to do that. Like a couple of us had brought it up initially, like, hey, maybe we should think about whatever and it was like nah it's not important it's not needed right now and that was the case i mean it really students had the time and we were there was there any incentive in your department to experiment in uh, doing anything online at all were you rewarded in the retention tenure and promotion process i wouldn't say specifically that we're rewarded when um in our retention tenure and promotion process i think whenever you're doing some kind of educational experience it's looked at accordingly. So whether it was looking to using technology in the classroom or using like lab alike assignments in a in a lecture class, I think whatever you're doing, as long as it's going towards and you're analyzing what it's going towards your professionalism and it's going towards student student learning and you're really being mindful about how you analyze that, I think I don't think it would matter what you were trying as long as you were trying something. I think it would be looked at the same. So this happened really, really fast for everybody. Were you surprised by how fast everything changed and how much time did you really have to come up with a plan for how you were gonna convert your face-to-face -face course into an online type of course? I'm definitely surprised. I'm still surprised daily. It's almost too much to, to open the news and start reading about how quickly things are changing just because it's so uh, dynamic, I guess, is this the right word for it. Some people had I would say that, Paul, you had a pretty good sense of how things were going to progress, and you've been, seems like, accurate for the most part. I really had no clue how this thing was going to play out. It's still changing day to day. So when you ask the question about how much time do we have to sort of make a plan and, and migrate to online, I almost feel like I'm still in that process. You know, we had roughly a week, maybe a week and a half, to get things going. But still, you know, each time I do you know, like hold a discussion section or have to give an exam or have to grade assignments is sort of always, um, always changing. Um, and it's, it's influencing how I'm making this transition to online. I remember like we had gotten a notification like, hey, start to think about if you were, if it needs to go to online. Like, and I've been thinking about it. And then I had a really bad cold. The... Monday, Tuesday before. So Wednesday, I told my students, we're just going to try the Zoom out. Like, we're, I'm not going to, it wasn't even that I was sick and contagious or whatever, but it was impacting my vocal cords. So like, for me to get to the back of a room of 40 students was really hard on, was really hard. So I said, just for one day, we're going to try it. And it was the Wednesday right before we, the day we got our notification that we we're going to fully online. And I thought, well, I mean, we had tried it a day and it worked and we were fine. And so we, I mean, it's flying by the seat of your pants, but I think that's part of instructing too. You know, um, I taught public school in K-12 before I worked here. And so it was consistent, like, oh, let me modify what I'm doing. And it was this consistent cycle of modification and you adjust to where you are. So I thought it was okay. So we got the notification on like, there's no Wednesday night that we were going to be fully online for at least a couple weeks. And I was like, Oh good. My house will get clean at one time this semester because I haven't had time to clean the house. And then um, Friday I was surprised with how fast my student, my children, my own personal children, how fast they transitioned because Friday they found out that they weren't coming back Monday and it was Friday afternoon. And I went from like this sheer, like, I'm going to have so much time. It's going to be so nice. I'm going to be having this time alone to, oh my God, now all three of us are going to be here all the time. So my joy was short lived, but I'm very surprised and very happily surprised with how fast the K-12 has adjusted as well. Like it seems as though after a few days, it's been getting smoother. 
And I feel like that in my practice too, like within a couple of days, my, my practice has gotten better, but I'm also being very honest with it and changing all the time. I, I would probably add also that we've sort of had this um, deadline, not deadline, but sort of this like break, you know, spring break is coming up is what yeah. I was trying to say. And there's been this sort of notion that we're just kind of sprinting to get to spring break uh, because theoretically during spring break, we'll have a chance to sort of slow down and, and catch up and reflect on the past week and a half. And maybe that's a chance that we're, that I'm at least going to have to make some adjustments and, and try to prepare for the rest of the semester pretty much. Yeah. I, um, I've been really reflective about like, and I know I'm probably stealing your thunder for later, Paul, but like, you know, if I knew that Monday was going to be the last day I saw some of my students because I was, well, I saw them virtually on Wednesday, but if I knew that Monday was the last day I was going to see, Monday and Tuesday were the last day I was going to see my students and some of them that are graduating, like, what would I have done differently? What would I have said differently? Like, I'm really struggling with that now. Like, my students that I've been their advisor for four years or three years and they're graduating, like, how approaching them, like, it's, that's what I've been struggling with is if I knew it was the last time I was going to see you face to face or we were going to have this conversation then what would have been different? Yeah, and like a lot of universities across the country, we've just said we're not going to have a graduation. So yeah, yeah this, this could be the last time. I didn't think about that till now, but for many of my students who may have taken classes with me multiple times over the years, yeah, I might never ever see them again in person. That's, uh, yeah, it's, and it's crazy to think about, like, and I feel badly like a lot of my students, I'm like, it's really important to graduate. You need to walk. It's important for your family. Like um, Ruby that we talked to on the previous, on the first generation podcast, that's it. I mean, that's it for her. I've been her advisor for three years. She's taken multiple classes with me and now she's not going to walk. Mm. Oh. And so to me, that's where I'm struggling with like a lot of the students that I've really like, yeah, it's really important. You should walk, you early commencement, walk, even though you're not going to finish all the way. And I, man, there I've blown it up in their head that it's so important. And now oh, just kidding, it's not important. <laughs> Health is more important. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. Just go, thanks. Now I'm sad. Yeah. 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 <laughs> this is the sad episode of the podcast. Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I've definitely been, you know, being really reflect on it. Like, mm. it, it's amazing to me how much of a relationship I've developed with students and how that's probably the hardest part about this is not the, you know, every second interact, like, not that I interact with them all the time, but they walk by my office, the doors open and they shout something into the office and they keep walking. But even that interaction, like that personal, informal interaction is gone hmm. and so you know online virtual office hours aren't the same as a stop by how are your students overall adapting to these changes and do you have some students who are at a technological disadvantage maybe because they don't have access to good wi-fi or or no wi-fi they might have housing insecurity and if you've run into those situations how have you tried to handle that? I definitely have students that are struggling with um, Wi-Fi connectivity issues, um, some that struggle with lack of technology. I emailed one of my students yesterday and I said, I've missed you a couple of times on the Zoom because he hadn't been on the Zoom yet and reminded him, you know, you can use your phone to do Zoom. You don't have to have a computer. And just reminding him of that, he's like, oh, Oh, and you're paying attention that I'm not there, but oh, I can use the, um, he didn't even realize that he could use Zoom on his phone. He thought he had to have a computer or a laptop. And so um, he's definitely now kind of getting back on board. Another one of my students is living in the on-campus housing because she has no internet at home. So she's just kind of waiting to see until they ask her to leave. Um, but that's the only place she has Wi-Fi, so she's staying in on-campus housing. I have another student who drives onto campus every day and sits in the library to do his classes because he doesn't have Wi-Fi at home. A few of our, a few of my students have lost their jobs in, because of everything, and so they're definitely adjusting to a new reality as well. And so really being as mindful as I can in my instruction 
you know, keeping it synchronous, but also offering that asynchronous in case they aren't able to come during the day. Um, a lot of my students who are international went home. And so, um, you know, they're 13, 14 hours difference to us now. And so it's just <laughs> totally different. You know, how do you, it's, how do you adjust when you have students that are in like multiple different countries around the globe now, as opposed to seeing them face to face every day? Have you had any kind of issues like that, Nolan, or how have your students been adjusting? Yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm embarrassed to say it. I don't know as much as Jessica knows about her students. Um, I do know from uh, a recent exam that I've had to give online. You know, I got a lot of emails with students saying their internet was was being causing them problems or they weren't able to upload files properly. Um, so, you know, I've had to sort of help them go through that process of, you know, if they don't have a scanner, what do they do? You know, there's plenty of good mobile apps that will allow you to produce PDF files so that you can produce a single PDF of your of your work just to just to complete the exam. Regarding things like housing and security, I, I just Unfortunately, I don't know. I'm not at that level with my students this semester. But, you know, I think one of the keys for all the faculty is we, we all need to be sort of understanding and flexible uh, for the many different sort of situations that students may be in. Um, so, you know, offering things like additional time or just being flexible with your policies is, I think, key here. Yeah, flexibility is definitely has been the key. And just being patient, too. Like, it's not anyone's fault. And so the more I can help students to manage and to make what's important important, like, is it important that you do this many homework problems or can you do a couple and we're just going to call it a day for right now? You're getting the learning, just keeping to what's really important. Nolan was mentioning that uh, he's been giving online tests. And I know one of the biggest concerns of faculty right now is how to maintain integrity to make sure students aren't cheating. And I know that some instructors have thought of the idea of having you know, webcams uh, aimed at the students during tests or using services like ProctorU, which, which requires you to have webcams. Of course, that runs into issues such as maybe students don't have webcams and now it's really hard to get them because stores are closed and everybody needs a webcam now. And so they're very, very hard to get on, on websites like Amazon. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering how, how you've handled this, Nolan, with the idea of maintaining uh, integrity to make sure students aren't cheating. Sure. Since this began, I've already had to give two exams online. And for, for my courses, the exams are, the nature of the exam is sort of short answer problem solving. So the, the, the entire two hour exam may just be three or four problems. And so, you know, it's this kind of where you, it's the type of exam where I've got to grade their process. Um, it doesn't even boil down to an numeric answer at the end. Um, and I think this type of exam is definitely the most challenging type of exam to administer remotely or virtually. It was definitely the biggest concern and kind of still is uh, about this migration to the virtual uh, format. And so there have been a lot of talks about these sort of sort of proctoring services. Um, and from my end, I just don't see that it's feasible, uh, especially with, with having students who may or may not have access to reliable internet. I think a service like, you know, watching all of your students on a webcam during the whole exam, to me at this point, just doesn't seem feasible. It feels a little bit too rushed and the expectation of the students seems a bit too high. So what I've done, if you're curious, is for both of my exams, I made the exams slightly more challenging. Um, I know that they're, you know, that typically my exams are closed book, but because they're going to be at home, I can't really police that. So I, I basically converted it to an open book, open calculator, open notes, open everything exam, cranked up the difficulty a notch or two. And I also did something that, you know, may, may be – it may prevent just a small percentage of students. Um, and it's just a small hindrance to cheating. But I, I, what I do is I have them write by hand sort of this integrity statement at the top of each page of their exam, which basically says, you know, I have not received any aid on this exam or not uh, provided any aid on this exam to other students. 
And so as they're writing their exam, in theory, they're looking at that I haven't cheated statement that they signed right in front of them. And for what it's worth, you know, it seems like the averages on my exams haven't changed that much. Uh, but of course, it's impossible to tell if you know the entire class is taking the exam together in one big room. It's impossible to tell, but that's the best that I've been able to come up with on such short notice. Yeah, I modified my exams to, with the intention of, I understand that you're going to have everything open to you. So I'm going to write a question that I think is um, works on the conceptual understanding of what we're talking about. So not only do you can you compute it numerically, but do you understand the concepts behind it? And can you explain to me your steps? So, you know, I told my students, you know, in the real world, if you're asked to do the statics problem and you don't remember, you're going to look it up anyways. And so kind of thinking as a more eh, professional type of exam where, yeah, they're going to need to know this later. And if you don't know it, you're going to suffer the ramifications later. And I'm just going to say, that's what we're going to do. So do you understand this conceptually? Can you explain to me why you're doing what you're doing and um, really apply what we're learning in class to this problem? And so the nature of the exam has changed. Yeah, it's, it's still open. It's still free response, but it's not timed. It's not anything anymore. I mean, but to me, that's been the best way to approach it. Like I had mentioned before, I had done some timed quizzes. I think just the unfamiliarity of it and having students then submit work separately from their quiz, it's just, it hasn't been the best scenario. And so for me at this point in time, that's the way we're approaching exams. So it, it sounds like you both are doing a pretty good job of adjusting given the circumstances and given the really small time frame to adjust. Do you know any of your colleagues that are having a much more difficult time adjusting to the online format? And I see Jessica's laughing in the uh, air, but <laughs> even know how to use Blackboard. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we all. So my, my question then, my follow up question then was going to be, what is the uh, biggest issue that you see with colleagues? I think my colleagues are adjusting great, actually. I mean, they're um, working very hard. In our department meeting, we were talking today about how it's almost like you have to almost redo your class, especially if it's something you've taught a long time. Like I'm spending a lot more time preparing for my online lectures and I'm spending a lot more time making things accessible to students than I did when I was doing face-to-face -face lecturing because I was kind of good. I knew what I was doing and we were just going to go. And it's really, um, I've spent a lot of time redoing and I've spent multiple hours preparing for each lecture, whereas I don't know that I did that during face-to-face. -face. And I think it's just that extra layer of adjusting I think my colleagues are the same. All of us have been kind of expressing like, you know, we're boiling down to what's important and we're letting go of the rest of it and using the technology to enhance it as much as we can. And everyone's approaching it differently. And so it's been interesting to hear how everyone's approach has been effective and not effective. But they've all, you know, everyone's using Blackboard, everyone's up on Zoom. Everyone, some people are using Camtasia and a bunch of different apps to like prepare videos. But I think it's been very good for us as a profession to really relook at what we're doing and how we're doing it. Yeah, I might, I might add that I consider myself to be relatively tech savvy. You know, I've, I've got a pretty, pretty cool tablet, laptop, webcam, headset set up at home here. I'm capable of producing videos and switching, you know, screen sharing between my tablet and MATLAB and so forth as I'm doing examples in MATLAB, I'm sorry, in discussion. But even still, as Jessica was saying, there have been these additional challenges just to make this transition and just thinking about things in a different way. Mm -hmm. You know, typically you're used to lecturing in front of a class. You can make adjustments on the fly. You can change your problems uh, live. Um, in order to do that in this setting, you also need to think about the technology that's sort of delivering all these, um, you know, lectures or discussions or whatever, whatever it may be. So it, ultimately, I think it just boils down to getting used to it. You know, if we do this for a few more weeks, it'll probably start to, you know, you, you'll, you'll hit your stride and you'll, you'll learn what works for you. Uh, but I can imagine, I, I, I don't know for certain, but I know that some of the other faculty who have 
not adopted so many tech, technological tools, may probably you know may have a harder time uh, adjusting at this point. But I figure, like anything else, um, with enough practice, you know, they'll they'll get up and running, and everybody will find their own way. I definitely think it depends on people's comfort level too, like and their personality. We were talking um, earlier in our department, like. I just don't feel comfortable doing that. Like, I don't think it's my style. So I'm not going to use something that I still don't think is my style. Like I'm finding my own online style. Um, I know what doesn't necessarily work for me online, but really looking at what does look at what, what does, what does work for me online and building on those. And I think expanding that practice is important. And as we were talking um, just for fun, I, I went and I looked up uh, the share price for zoom and uh, the market right now has been tanking the last couple of months, but Zoom's been going in the opposite direction. <laughs> I imagine so. We were, I was just in a meeting before this with some colleagues from grad school, and we were talking about, man, I should have bought Zoom. Yeah, that, that, that software is single-handedly saving higher education. All, all the way down, G12. My, yeah. uh, my kids are using it. And, you know, either Google Hangouts or Zoom between the two, that's, that's what they're learning right now. I would say it's beyond education too. I know a lot yeah. of my in-laws are using it just corporate, you know, in corporate environment as well. Yeah. I All had the meetings. I had two uh, dinners with uh, virtual dinners with friends and family this weekend using zoom. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, education, personal, professional, corporate, yeah. everything. So we've talked a little bit about some of the challenging aspects for you adjusting to online instruction, such as keeping, you know, first year students, you know, having them keep up with the work and trying to administer tests. What positive aspects have you seen moving to online instruction and interacting with students online, if any? Well, I, I might say that, you know, fundamentally, this is my first time running what's basically an asynchronous flipped model where students are expected to watch the entire lecture first. And then we'll have sort of a, a live discussion where we can reinforce those concepts using examples and I'll answer questions in real time. So if anything, I would say that th the benefit is that you get more reinforcement this way. I mean, the, the same benefits that you get from all of the literature that, that claims the benefits of the flipped model I'm getting here in this, in this uh, atmosphere. Um, essentially, you know, students are seeing it once uh, on the video and they're seeing it again as we discuss it during the discussion section. So it's almost like they're seeing each topic twice, which is more work for them, but I think that's a positive thing. They're going to get more exposure to the material, um, ask better questions and get more engaged with it and, and uh, be able to solve more challenging problems. I think students are definitely... Um in an environment of their comfort as well. So, you know, they're in their space, wherever it would be. I think um, thinking about, you know, as an institution or Hispanic serving institution, and I think it's important to think about the needs of all of our students and how we can make education flexible for students. And, you know, sometimes an extra hour at work before you have to commute to school to come in for one class is that's a lot of money and a lot of time and effort for a lot of students. So I think, I mean, I have had students on the zoom from the break room at their work. So like you see like people getting their lunch behind them and everything, but they're able to maintain their, their outside of school life more easily, I think. And so I, and you know, they have their dogs around them. So like the stress filter is lower. I had a senior project class yesterday meeting and everyone was like, had their dogs. A couple of people were outside. We had an entire like show and tell of everyone's dogs <laughs> for 10 minutes. And I think it's nice that people are, are making their education more personal. They're in their own space. They're able to adjust. And you know, I think it's nice. I think I need to do some some more of that. Um, maybe using a little bit of class time for for stuff that's not necessarily just related for getting the content to the students. Maybe to make the whole experience a little more enjoyable for everyone. It's hard. I know. Um, in our senior project group yesterday, we talked about how like you know it's nice, it's fine, whatever. I have a lot more free time, but I really miss interacting with my peers. 
and students really miss interacting with their peers. So I know I've been like, you know, I'll turn on the meeting and I'll maybe start the meeting a couple minutes early and people are there and, you know, they just try to, they talk about whatever. Um, someone's kids will pop into the camera and say hi to the kids or whatever. Uh, my son, on a side note, my son, has Zoom meetings for his class. And so he'll wear like a wacky hat every time he's on. He, uh, yesterday, he had a turkey hat on a couple of days ago. Yesterday he was in a Stormtrooper helmet for part of his lecture. And so I emailed his teacher to apologize. <laughs> but it was good, like, you know, they're having this opportunity to interact with each other and be silly a little bit too, and then get down to the business of learning. And so being a little more open with themselves. I would ask Jessica, you know, it seems like you've got a, a really good rapport with your students, even in the online setting, uh, where you've got, you know, you've got video feeds from your students and, and dogs walking around in the background and, and people just chatting. My experience so far is that when I open up my room, it's just me. I, I've got a video of my big face just sitting there right in the middle. Um, and I'll talk and I'll keep tabs on the chat window. And students are very active in the chat. Uh, but aside from that, you know, one or two students may chime in once in a while just on audio. That's about it. Uh, is there will, anything you're doing I to will say encourage? That that's the way it is during lecture most of the time. But okay. um, I sent home, before we started, I sent home some norms for Zoom meetings. And I sent home, like, you know, I, I sent an email to all my students. Um, these are my expectations on a Zoom meeting. I do anticipate that you're there. I would like to see your face because I miss you. I'm being very honest, right? Like I do miss interacting with you. So you don't have to have the camera on the whole time, but I would love to see you at least once. And so, um, and then as we started talking, I said, you know, I'm sharing my screen so I can see a little bit on the side. And so I get feedback from you, you know, if you're, if you're understanding or not, I can tell because I can see the look on your faces. So the more that you have your camera up, the less you have to talk but also i think too just the vibe in the classroom before that is that you know everyone kind of knows each other my major that i teach in is pretty small so everyone gets to know each other really quickly and that seems to be working it's different with my freshmen because they're different majors um they are interacting well as well but they're less chatty with each other but um i will say in my classes within the major. I just have really been mindful to tell students, you know, I miss you. I want to see you. I think it's important that we still interact with each other. And so I sent out norms beforehand, like, this is what I anticipate from you. This is how I expect for you to behave when you're online. Just like you would in any regular classroom, you have your set of norms in your classroom. I um, sent out some norms for Zoom meetings, and it's been really it's worked really well. Like everyone knows exactly, like these are the dates we're meeting. This is what we're going to discuss tentatively. And, um, but setting that expectation out to begin with has been really nice and telling them, you know, I'm going to record it as well so that if you are international and now you cannot get to the meeting in time, you can still see it or you can still hear it. But then, um, that changes everyone's behavior if they know it's being recorded too. I don't start the recording right away as they come on to the video. Like I see their little screen pop up. And so I say hello to them. I interact with each of them individually as they enter into the Zoom meeting. And I think it's kind of like, oh, you're already acknowledging that I'm here. So you know I'm here. And we can have a little bit of interaction before the business part starts. That's a, yeah, it's a really good, good idea. I, I hadn't thought about that. Thanks. I think we're too cold to our, our students, Nolan. <laughs> Perhaps. Well, I love, I, um, well, part of, part I of it's, share, and I try to share with them as much information as I have too. Like, I don't want to scare them, but you know, also like, oh, I've heard that this is the, what's happening with parking. Like, so someone will say, oh, I heard parking is this way. And I, so I'll, inter I'll investigate it a little bit and then like share like, Hey, you get a refund on your parking permit if you know your parking permit in. And so then they're very excited about them. They want to talk about parking <laughs> yeah, I would say that uh, maybe it's just an assumption that I had. You know, if I walk into a classroom live, I will just sort of naturally start that conversation and, and naturally try and foster that rapport. 
But in an online setting, everything's different. There are no expectations. So I think setting them outright, you know, yeah. explicitly stating what the norms are, I think is a really good idea. And I'll, just, probably, I'll probably do that. Yeah, and it's not, I mean, just saying like, you know, I, I, and I coming from a selfish place when I give you these norms, I really want to interact with you. I enjoy your time. I enjoy your company. Some of you more than others, but I do enjoy you. <laughs> and uh, we get a much better educational experience if we're interacting with each other in my style of teaching. Sure. Yeah, no, I've, I've seen Nolan actually uh, give lectures to his, his class and, and there's a lot of laughter in the class. And yeah, and, yeah I think it's just a, t a completely different way of interacting with students online. And so I, I have to completely relearn um, how to work within this environment. When I did my practice, um, because I was sick, Zoom, I didn't have expectations. And so a lot of my students were like, oh, it was fine. You know, and it was fine. But um, I looked, I would look at my screen, and I would just see black. And I'm like, oh, it's so depressing. Like, I have no idea what's going on. I have no interaction. So yeah, I just, I decided once we knew we were going at least partially online for part of the semester, which is now the rest of the semester, I said, that's it. We're, no, I need to tell you exactly what would work best for me to serve you better. So for other engineering instructors and engineering students who are going through this crisis, do you have any general advice for how to survive through this crazy time? And, and if someone's listening to this years later when there's another crazy time, uh, you know, what kind of advice would you give to that person? Well, I, for faculty and instructors at least, over the short period of time that I've been doing this, uh, one of the key things I learned, and it's something that we've mentioned earlier, is that the communication part of things is absolutely key to making the experience more sort of bearable. You know, providing a couple of times a week, just updates, emails to students saying, you know, here's what to expect for the next few days, uh, reminding them where to get the information they need on Blackboard, posting, you know, office hours very prominently so they have access to you when they you know, when they need it, all those things are really going to go a long way uh, for both students and instructors, I would, I would argue. And then one thing that I've also noticed is, we, we also sort of just touched on this, but enabling video during uh, office hours, I think goes a long way. It, it makes the conversation more natural um, and I think more personal. And so you get a more personal connection if you can see the person on the other end of the line. So, so it just really boils down to communication and sort of trying to make the experience a little bit more human in any way possible. I agree. I think um, being flexible and being able to adjust to people's needs and understanding really that it's not the same as it was and it's okay, it's just different. But I think it's really helped me to understand what's, important in what I'm teaching and being mindful of sticking to the minute details I don't need. I really need you to understand conceptually what's going on. And so I'm going to focus conceptually on what's going on. I mean, it's even changed the flow of my class. Like I'm moving topics around because I'm like, wait a minute, while that made sense previously to me right now, this is how I'm flowing more in my class. And this is what's making more sense to me from a remote curricular standpoint. So it's been just being flexible and being reflective on the process, which sometimes though gets you into the rabbit hole of like, you know, I'm so sad now people are gone, but being reflective is really important. So one day might be a few months from now, it might, might be a year from now, but it'll be safe again to go to restaurants and to shake hands and to go back into the classroom with our students. Based on your experience so far, do you think that all of this experience will change how you interact with students after this crisis is over? Um, I definitely think it will change, but I think it's an important lesson for us to learn as a system too. Like we've learned this flexibility, so how can we maintain this flexibility going forward? I think our students have a lot of needs which we just assume are as not as important as being in school. But, you know, putting food on the table and working exorbitant amount of hours is really hard. And so how, is, how can we, as a higher education system, maintain what we're doing, but also be flexible to the needs of students? So 
I think that flexibility will make a huge difference on how I interact with students going forward. And I feel like I was already pretty flexible in my instruction, but um, I still think I could be even more accommodating to student needs. As far as how I interact with people, hmm, I think so. I'm not sure. I'm pretty personable with my students, but I definitely hope to not leave anything like hanging and dangling. Like we're gonna just handle whatever we need to handle right away and then the next time whatever we're gonna talk about, but not like, oh, later let's take care of that petition or later let's take care of this. We're just gonna take care of it right now. We're not gonna worry about doing it later. We're gonna do it now. Like I was advising a student today and I pulled up their degree progress report and I'm like, oh shoot, I left that note. We have to do a petition for X, Y, and Z. Dang, I wish I would have done it when we were face to face and we could both sign it right there and we didn't have to worry about it. So I think that would be the, what I would change in my practice going forward is to just handle things right away. Um, and especially if it's paperwork. Sure. Even looking back on the past couple of weeks, what I really miss is actually standing in front of the class and, and interacting with them and just teaching in person. But having said that, looking back on, you know, my entire time at Cal Poly, um, it's somewhat selfish in a way that I enjoy that portion of instruction so much that that's the only part of my class that they really get the information. In other words, what I'm saying is I haven't made my classes very flexible at all. You know, if you sort of miss the lecture, that's kind of it. So there's nothing to back that up. Um, and so, you know, looking at the wide array of tools that we have available, and being forced to become familiar with those tools over this little bit, I think it'll probably change how I sort of, my, it'll change the perspective of how I deliver a class as a whole. I'm never going to stop lecturing in person. Um, that's the part I enjoy most about teaching. But, but with, you know, things like Zoom and Blackboard and all the features that those have, using those tools to make the course is more accessible for students who maybe can't get to every lecture. Um, mm -hmm. That's probably one of the biggest takeaways that I've had so far. Yeah, and I think offering students support doesn't mean they're not going to come to class. I think that's for me one of the biggest shifts I've been thinking about. Like, even if I offer, like, I have this AC, I have the videos uploaded, I have their notes uploaded pre before we start. I so whatever we're going to do in class in our synchronous lesson, I have it uploaded before. Um, and then afterwards, I've taken all the notes that I've taken um, during the section and I'm posting them, but they're still showing up and they're still interacting. So even if we're providing those supports to students, it doesn't mean they're not going to come to class. Maybe if there's an emergency, then they, it's not going to be so life alteringly horrible if they don't get there, but they're still coming. And so even as I'm providing them these things, it doesn't take away from that interaction. And I think that's kind of a shift to me. Like, I don't want to, I, I was really upfront and honest in the first, in my first few years and I was, in my first year I was giving them everything and I didn't really notice, but then someone said something like, oh, maybe they won't show up. Let me try to not give them like my notes from in class. And um, I think I need to go back to just being, just providing everything for students so that, you know, if they can listen to the lecture in real time and maybe not have to take notes and then they can go home and they can listen to it again and take notes. That's that's very valuable and so i think um it's not i think it will definitely change the way i interact in that way yeah and i know from my own experience for about the last five years or so i've been recording my in-class lectures uh using camtasia and then i'll just upload them to youtube as a supplemental tool and you know one of the big concerns that a lot of faculty have is exactly what you're saying is well then why you know do you need a faculty member they're just not going to come to class and I've actually found that not to be true at all. I think students, many of them want that social interaction and this is also their way of making sure that they force themselves to keep up with the material. And if anything, I've once a year, I'll have a student just randomly come up and say, you know, thank you for making that available. I went through an illness or something with my family and it was because of this that I didn't have to drop the class. So. Well, and then even our students with learning challenges or that oh, have yeah. learning difference, like if they're an auditory learner, they can't listen and take notes at the same time. Like that doesn't function for them. 
And so, yeah, they have a note taker, but if you can take your own notes, it's different. And so if you've heard it once, you're not so fearful of, I'm gonna miss something, you can go back and take notes later. So I think it's really helpful. And I think that's definitely, I'm going back to that when all this is over. I'll do the regular lecture and do my thing and whatever, but I definitely think I'm going to be either recording somehow in class and posting that. I think it's, I think it's really valuable for students and I think it takes some of the in-class pressure off and I'm hoping that it just allows students to be present in the lecture and to learn as opposed to being like writing as quick as I can. Well, Nolan and Jessica, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to, to have this conversation. I hope you know any students or, or faculty listening to this will feel maybe a little less alone, <laughs> maybe feel a little bit comforted that we're all going through this thing together. And, and if you're willing, I'd love to follow up in a few weeks once things are predicted to be a little more crazy and see if your opinions or attitudes uh, have changed since then. Sure. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. All right, stay healthy, everyone. Thanks, talk to you later. Thanks, Paul. I would like to again thank Dr. Nolan Suchia and Dr. Jessica Perez for spending some time with me to share their experiences of what it's like to be an engineering instructor in the early stages of this COVID-19 crisis. As events on the ground change in the coming weeks, I'm hoping that we can check in with Nolan and Jessica again to see how they're handling the situation. If you enjoyed this podcast, there are a few ways to support it. You can subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast app, such as Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Spotify, and many others. You can rate the podcast and leave comments on whatever app you use to listen to the podcast. And finally, You can help spread the word about the podcast by telling your friends, family, classmates, or whomever you think would benefit from this podcast. If you have any comments about the episode, feel free to email me at tesepodcast at gmail.com, and I'll place the email address in the show notes. I'll personally read each email and try my best to respond to all of them. Goodbye for now, and good luck, everyone.